this show, I've often spoken about wisdom. I've spoken about the wisdom of the ancestors, and I've spoken about the wisdom of the Stoics and of other philosophers. And it has sometimes led to the question of what exactly is wisdom in the first place? What are we talking about when we're talking about wisdom? Is it a special kind of knowledge that somebody has? Is it a special kind of intelligence that somebody has? I mean, how is it that some people seem to have wisdom and others don't? Is it as simple as age? Because, you know, popular thought often tells us that uh, wisdom is a product of age. It does getting older automatically make you wise. It's one thing to talk about wisdom, but we've got to actually understand what it is that we seek. And so, as usual, in my readings around, in my daily life, I came across a new article about wisdom and about what the meaning of wisdom is today by the uh, European psychologist uh, Igor Grossman in a, in a recent European publication. And he tries to reassess what wisdom is about. And there were some key points in there that I thought would be really interesting to understand in our quest for wisdom, whether we're looking at the ancient philosophers or something a little bit closer to home. Generally, wisdom is defined as a kind of awareness. It is a kind of awareness that allows us to think correctly and act correctly in our world using the knowledge that we have, our past experience, our understanding of everything that's going on, as well as our common sense, and finally our insight in a mature way and in a useful way. That is the more or less the definition of wisdom that is usually given in an encyclopedia or a dictionary or anywhere else that you read about it. And the general idea, certainly the general consensus, is that wisdom is associated with a mixture of knowledge, understanding and experience, and that it's also associated with certain personal attributes such as compassion and self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is something that we seek in our spiritual paths and certainly was the object of the philosophers that not only to know how to handle the world and manage the very difficult world that we live in, but also to know yourself, to realize yourself, to become aware and aware of what it is to be human. So wisdom also has strong associations with the practices of non-attachment, the practices of benevolence and a strong ethical approach to life. Wisdom itself seems to be something to do with ethics. But when we go all the way back to Aristotle, Aristotle said that wisdom is understanding the causes of things, knowing why things are the way they are. And he says wisdom is because it's more than knowing just that they are, it's knowing why they are. So that is one of the core philosophical foundations of what wisdom is really all about and what is it that we seek. It doesn't touch much on, on perhaps the more spiritual and even religious ideas of wisdom, which included the ideas of benevolence and compassion and detachment. And it would seem quite necessary that in order to, for wisdom be, to be go beyond facts, it needs to have a certain human element to it. Does the spiritual approach perhaps offer something more, perhaps make a little bit of sense? In our religions, we see the requirements for wisdom, and so I'm not going to go into much about the Judeo-Christian ideas of what wisdom are. They are generally quite important, but quite based around the practices of um, what those religions are all about. But I was intrigued to see um, something said by an Inuit elder who said that a person becomes wise when they can see what needs to be done and can do that without being told what to do. And I love that definition because it actually encompasses a few other things which we're not discussing in detail here, but certainly that being told what to do. 
it sounds like advice for a parent, but there is a deeper wisdom, deeper wisdom in that statement by the Inuit elder. Because without being told what to do, it means an inner knowing of what the right thing is in any particular situation. That knowledge of what the right thing is in any particular situation may certainly come from experience and um, an actual knowledge, awareness of facts. But there is that added element that perhaps is our first inkling of what true wisdom really is. And that is that it seems also to come from within or have some greater perspective. I don't need to be told. And what is important about that, why that is such a relevant definition of it, is precisely because there is this awareness of something greater than me. I might say without needing to be told, refers to parents or other elders or people in the know. And that is my first awareness of something greater than me. But there's also a sense in the practice of wisdom of awareness of other people other beings, nature itself, the bigger world around you. So the more we look at what wisdom is, the more impersonal we see that wisdom seems to be defined as. It's not uncommon to find that uh, various different cultures refer to wisdom in the context of something greater than ourselves. But when, when we analyze what different cultures say about wisdom, and there have been many studies, cross-cultural studies, basically the conclusion is that there is an idea that in all cultures that wisdom has an association with intelligence and perceptive, perceptiveness and spirituality. But at the bottom line, when you look at it, why does it exist? Why is it commented on by different cultures? It's essentially that wisdom is a form of expertise, and that is an expertise in dealing with the difficult questions of life, adapting to the complex requirements of life, and adapting to the complex requirements of living in a social situation. Human beings are social creatures, and so our wisdom is often about how do we live with other human beings, and how do we respond to other human beings? For me, and my whole interest in what is wisdom, really relates a lot to how do we respond, not only to questions. I don't mean wisdom as in having to be a wise guru and have some piece of knowledge that somebody wants, but more in how to deal with the everyday stuff that happens to all of us all the time. The interactions and the things that are said to us, the things we read on Facebook and our reactions to those kind of things, the more that we look at the world around us, to me it seems the less wisdom there is. People respond in ways that in retrospect look a little silly, if not stupid, to things that say on Facebook, which escalate or Twitter, escalate into great big flame wars and all sorts of unnecessary uh, name-calling, things people would never do or say, and it seems increasingly that there's a lack of basic wisdom. That is the wisdom of dealing with other people and handling other people. But in a world where Facebook exists and where we have these much more complex interaction, those studies that show that wisdom is related to dealing with the complex requirements of life seem ever more important. Of course, um, cultures that do deal with it very directly are Buddhism and Hinduism, which in, in those religions and practices there is a strong emphasis on detachment from all the troubles of the world. The Buddhists have the Four Noble Truths, which are all really about breaking away from suffering, which is caused by entanglement in emotions and outcomes in the material world. The Four Noble Truths are a principle by which Buddhists learn to break away and meditate and detach from the need for outcomes and reactions. In other words, the most basic of Buddhist practices are really all about wisdom, about getting this greater awareness and greater knowledge. 
in Hinduism it's more explicitly stated that knowing oneself is the wisdom that we seek. Because if I'm defining wisdom as knowing yourself and knowing how to handle yourself, knowing how to handle the complex world and knowing how to handle other people in it, well, I guess that's what religion has been trying to teach us, whichever religion it is. But I don't think religion is the path for everyone when it comes to seeking wisdom. Religion also has a tendency to say that my wisdom is more correct than your wisdom. My wisdom is right and your wisdom is wrong. Could that be? Could wisdom be something different from one group of human beings to another human beings? I somewhat doubt that. I would imagine that perhaps wisdom is the ability to understand that the different religions are expressing the same thing, perhaps in different ways. And wisdom is the ability to understand that they are all, like philosophy, guides to living more successfully as an individual and as a social creature. That is the aim of wisdom. So a more modern approach might be to look at what do psychologists say and what do thinkers in the modern context of the human mind say about it. Um, Lejess is a doctor from Harvard, a, a psychiatrist from Harvard, who says we need a new definition, a theoretical definition, that takes into account the various different cultural, religious and philosophical themes. And when we do that, we find that wisdom represents a demonstrated superior ability to understand the nature and behavior of things, people, and events. That's the gist. A demonstrated superior ability to understand the nature and behavior of things, people, and events. And he says that that results in an increased ability to predict behavior or events, and then that leads to the ability to benefit yourself or others. So it's a, a superior ability to understand what's going down, that gives you the ability to predict the outcomes of things and the likelihood of outcomes, and that gives you benefits to yourself and others. It sounds a little bit like an evolutionary advantage kind of approach. There is a lot of truth in that, I think, because certainly it's talking about you know gaining mastery over things, people, and events. But his idea that it's used to benefit self or others I wonder. Certainly, like all creatures on this planet, we are at heart trying to benefit ourselves. We pursue our own goals, and although as human beings we've developed all sorts of wonderful, noble things, our animal nature, if we want to still call it that, is this competitive, win-at-any-cost survive that is perhaps driven by evolution or whatever exactly it is that drives this mysterious species and mysterious life on Earth. But certainly, um, it's true that we seek advantage over other creatures. I would like to argue that perhaps part of human consciousness is to understand that in the longer run, advantage over others is not an advantage. That in the longer run, and perhaps this was the original idea long ago, the advantage is for the group. And while the group might once have been your tribe, your group, your culture, your country, we need to understand in, in our times that the group is the human species. All of us, all seven billion of us who struggle together on this planet and who make life for all other creatures so difficult because we do seem to be the most troublesome creature on the planet. So I think in, in our thinking today, we need to break past this idea of I'm trying to gain an advantage. When I say I'm trying to live my life better by studying philosophy and by studying wisdom, it's not just so that I have an advantage in that evolutionary sense of the word, although it would be naive to deny that. But it's also so that I can live better amongst my fellow human beings, and they can too. It's something that is similar to the idea of you know, if you continuously meet hatred with love, as cheesy as it sounds, it's really, really true, that eventually the hater does break down or reduce or disappear or turn to love because it just becomes a pointless exercise for them and they start feeling and looking stupid. 
That old cliche, which is true and very well worth practicing, is what I'm talking about, what I think the meaning and effects of wisdom can be and how it can go beyond ourselves. That if we consistently treat people with wisdom, acceptance, tolerance, understanding and detachment, we begin to spread that in some way. So perhaps we can look at people who are defined as wise or who are experienced by others as wise, wise, what do they have? What do they do? Well, certainly they seem to have a kind of optimism. They have an optimism that problems can be solved and they tend to take a calm and um, somewhat detached approach to dealing with the stuff that life throws us at us. Difficult decisions, difficult situations. They seem to be calm and detached in the process of dealing with those. And maintaining that calmness seems to be one of the characteristics of wisdom related to an ability to see the bigger picture. A sense of proportion that comes from seeing that bigger picture. And most importantly, a certain amount of self-reflection that goes with that. Other characteristics of wisdom seem to be the ability to problem solve. The ability to problem solve in context and to take actions which are appropriate and knowledgeable. So it's the ability to recognize what's going on and respond accordingly, but especially to the context. Context is not only understanding what's going on here, it is an awareness of the circumstances and awareness of the limits in the current circumstances, who you're dealing with, what you're dealing with. Context seems to be so important to wisdom because that takes others into account. That is where tolerance comes from. Tolerance not only to other human beings, but to the situation at hand. So our values need to be ethically based. We need to understand how, this, how the people, things, animals, etc. that we are involved with understand on and are experiencing a situation so we can behave accordingly. And also tolerance towards uncertainty and fear. We need to be accepting that a person in a situation where wisdom would be a better option is often experiencing fear and anxiety, not knowing what on earth is going on, and that is creating irrational, crazy reactions that we might think, if only they were wise. Wisdom does not include judgment. Wisdom is about tolerance and understanding of the human condition. So, empathy is in there, and I think empathy with yourself is the most important thing. Understanding your own values, firstly, being tolerant and kind to yourself, and most important, seeing yourself as part of a larger whole. All of that leads you to be able to overcome the feelings of personal harm, hard done by, feelings of vulnerability uh, of yourself. If you learn to see the bigger picture and are compassionate on yourself and others, then wisdom lets you overcome the feelings of helplessness and powerlessness and reaction and aggression and anger because we're also accepting whether or not we actually understand something. So we start finding things as more meaningful, more an opportunity to understand life and to cope with life by engaging according to the context with compassion and awareness. So that's the meaning of understanding that seems to be behind it all. A South African philosopher, uh, Thaddeus Metz, who's a professor of philosophy at the University of Johannesburg, points out that you know these, these definitions of wisdom often lack an emotional quality, which he says is interesting because the word philosophy means love of wisdom. And so wisdom seems to have an emotional quality to it. He says philosophers will say everything that I just said wisdom is knowing what to do when and all of that kind of thing and he says philosophers are focusing exclusively on the rational the theoretical the practical and are not acknowledging the human experience at all he says a wise person has certain beliefs and makes decisions because of them but she might also be 
Why? It's because of her feelings and how she responds to them. Because speaking as a South African, he says, look at racism and hate and xenophobia. He says, what could be more unwise than hating other people? What could be more unwise than the emotion of hate? It makes no sense at all, and it's a feeling. It makes no sense because the thing that makes other people different might be a color or a cultural practice, but they are the same human beings as ourselves. He says, the lack of wisdom consists not merely of the false beliefs that have led to the hatred or the poor choices that xenophobes, xenophobes might make because of their hatred. The hatred itself is unwise and would be even if it was never acted on. He says, hatred or being repulsed by other people is as unwise as hating yourself. Being humble as Socrates says, is one thing, but being uh, feeling unworthy and feeling bad about yourself is something else. That's self-hate and can be related to guilt or the feeling of doing wrong. And self-hate usually leads to the hate for others, blaming them, finding reasons to find yourself better than them. All of those are based around self-hatred. As Matt says, self-hatred often leads to bad decisions such as not taking responsibility for one's mistakes, being overly sensitive to slights, and lashing out at others. So, hatred, disgust, guilt, negative emotions, that is where the lack of wisdom lies. Sometimes it might be unwise to love. It's not always the right thing. It would be unwise for you to love someone who abuses you, says Metz. Who will never love you back. So we mustn't forget that wisdom is wrapped up in our feelings. He says a wise person surely would love what is truly worth loving. There is a powerful thought in that. So we can't detach our feelings from the whole experience of wisdom is. Wisdom is connected to love argues the South African philosopher and says if we love wisely we are still engaging in wisdom. It's not always rational and that does relate to the understanding that generally we now know that wisdom is a little bit less rational than we think because it seems to be context bound. We've seen in studies that students who learn about wise and compassionate people do not necessarily become wise and compassionate. Can wisdom be learnt? Can wisdom be taught? Well, wisdom is about context, as we've said, and changing the context of thinking can lead to wiser outcomes. So, one of the ways that wisdom is taught, since it can't be just taught by example, is this is what's achieved success. When people are asked to think of something as if it happened a year ago, and focus on it as if it's happening to another person, not themselves, a long time ago, not now. They will often come up with wiser ideas and suggestions about what should be done. So these are called distancing techniques. And distancing techniques help us take a less egocentric approach to our lives. Less trapped in the urgency of me, here, now, I want this fixed, I want closure, I need this done. If we look at it as if it was the past and if it was someone else, we can wisely say, well, with patience things will follow through, or I know it hurts now, hang in there. Our wisdom is often based on common sense and context and past experience. So the learning of wisdom is about putting yourself as if you were in the past. See? You know, the Socratic method, the method of philosophy really, is about gaining wisdom through discussion, not just about sitting and thinking and self-reflecting. So think about this, and this is fundamentally um, what this new paper on wisdom was really all about. Wisdom is a path. Wisdom is a way. Wisdom is a journey. It's a path along which we learn to think in a more balanced fashion, we, think to, we learn to think in a more expanded um, fashion. But like every journey, it is best not done alone, but in the company of others. 
Wisdom is a human emotion, much more than a rational understanding. Another one of those topics that there is so much to say about, we can only just touch on the surface. And I just wanted to give you some thoughts to think about your journey into becoming a wiser person. Join me again on Friday at the usual time, 12 o'clock on YouTube, 7.30 p.m. on Cape Town TV, and of course repeating Sunday on 1.30 p.m. Tell your friends. See you.